Welcome to Establish the Edge. I'm your host, Mike Leone, back with a solo edition of the podcast. We'll have uh, a partner with me tomorrow on the podcast. Really excited to bring on Pat Crane of NBC Sports Edge to flush out an article that he wrote looking at the types of upside that each running back has, their odds of basically having a legendary running back season. So that's going to be really exciting for today's show. It's going to be a quicker episode. I just want to get out a few thoughts on an NFFC auction draft that I recently did and how you could apply some of those concepts to an NFFC auction or your home auction league. And then a few notes at the very end of this podcast um, that I've just picked up as I've done more FFPC main event drafts. Maybe that helps you out if you're doing that format. Uh, might be applicable to your home league, but it's most applicable you know, specifically to FFPC main events. Before we get into it, note that this podcast is brought to you by Underdog Fantasy. They have an absurd $2 million to first place, $1 million to second place in their Best Ball Mania 3 tournament, an additional third million dollar grand prize to the regular season points leader. If you use promo code ETR when you sign up, they're going to match your initial deposit up to $100. It's a great way to get prepped for your home leagues by playing in these real money underdog leagues. So visit Underdog Fantasy and use promo code ETR for up to $100 in free entries. So this NFFC auction I did, just to set the format for you, it's a $200 budget. This is a, it's a self-contained 12-team league, but there is an overall prize. It's not like the huge tournaments because the auctions, it's $150 entry price point. I think the grand prize is like $10,000. So it's a fun little tournament. You're not competing against a ton of other leagues, but there is an overall component to it. Do you want to note that their scoring is full PPR. It is not tight end premium. You start three wide receivers and a flex, one flex and two running backs. So it definitely leans towards the wide receiver heavier builds that I've talked about. If you're going zero RB, like this is the kind of format that you're looking for. As far as quarterback scoring, it's aggressive. Six points per passing touchdown. I think it's also one point per 20 yards passing. So it's really quite aggressive in terms of the quarterback scoring that helps out the pure pocket passers a bit more and also helps out the guys with huge pass volume up top to separate a bit more. So I've got up on my screen. If you're watching on the established to run YouTube channel, my team, I'll go through it. So people know what the final team is and then kind of talk through, you know, what mistakes I made, um, where it could have gone better, where I think it went well, but this team is at quarterback. I have a $15 Patrick Mahomes running back a $20 breeze hall, a $7 Miles Sanders, Wide receiver, a $39 CD Lamb, $42 Stefan Diggs, $18 Amon Ross St. Brown. In my flex, a $14 Juju Smith Schuster. I have a $16 Darren Waller at tight end. And then my bench looks like a $16 Chris Godwin. And then basically all one and $2 players after that. My favorite $2 players were Traylon Burks and Rashad White, which I think were really. Really good deals and actually was quite lucky to have them because I kind of screwed up in terms of the amount of money I left for myself on the bench. But I'm also going to flash up the ADPs so you can see uh, NFFC has a nice ADP draft board that you can look at. So it's just the August ADPs and it's it's like an ADP board, like a snake draft, but has the average auction value of each player. And of course, I'll announce some of these because if you're listening on the podcast, you can't see the board. Um but I think if you take a look at the board, what you notice, in my opinion, is the wide receivers in the starting at the middle of round three, going through the end of round six are really undervalued for this format where you need not only wide receiver upside, but you need wide receiver depth because you want to be starting four wide receivers a week, ideally. And even if you run pure at running back, you're only starting three wide receivers a week. I mean, it's still tough to fill those positions as busts and injuries happen over the course of the season. So you start to see DJ Moore, AJ Brown, Jalen Waddle have ADPs of right around $24 to $25. Some of the breakout candidates I really like, like Gabriel Davis has an ADP of $19. Then you get guys like Jerry Judy in the fifth, in this fifth round in particular, Judy, $17. Bateman, $17. Amon Ra, St. Brown, $16. Chris Godwin, $14. If you extend to the sixth round, Juju Smith-Schuster, $13. Elijah Moore, $13. So to me, like understanding systemically, if you're in a league like this, 
I think the move is to just stockpile so many of those wide receivers in that range, all the way from DJ Moore down to Elijah Moore, that 13 to $25 range. Uh, Moore and AJ Brown give you some of that high end upside. Obviously, you don't have the security and safety of some of the super high guys. And then you do have the breakout potential from guys. So I think it sets you up to have a pretty stable team, but with a ton of upside. And that leaves you room to spend up and do a hero running back build. Now, where I screwed up was I was kind of price enforcing a little bit early on some of the high, high end receivers. And as I noted, I got Stefan Diggs for $42, CD Lamb for $39. That was overkill. I really, you know, given what I knew about the average auction prices going in, I did not need to get two of the top, top tier wide receivers. I could have just gotten one. I could have honestly gotten zero and gone DJ Moore and AJ Brown. I still think like I did okay pulling it off, but the issues this caused for me was my hero RB ends up being Brees Hall at $20 when I easily could have saved, you know, I could have swapped out digs for Juju Smith Schuster. And we're talking like a $25 difference that takes me from Brees Hall all the way up to an Aaron Jones, an Alvin Kamara, even a DeAndre Swift type. And I'm looking at a much better hero running back build. And then I maybe even have a little bit more money for my bench. So that's one thing too. If you, I mean, you really should try to be disciplined early. Of course, the worst thing you can do in auction is not spend all your money. But if you have a solid plan, you have archetypes of players that you're going after and different options, and you can be patient and disciplined and still spend all your money and leave yourself three to five dollars for guys, you know, at the at the end game. Because if you have three to five dollars when everyone has one to two, you control the board at the end of the auction. As I noted, I got Traylon Burks for two, Rashad White for two. That's something that's probably not going to happen very often. Uh, and then I had to go all one dollar guys. If I didn't get lucky on those guys, I really could have had a really bad bench. And if I had a bit more money, I could have taken, you know, I could have gotten like George Pickens as, as a nice bench guy. I could have gotten some more of you know, the zero running back candidates that I really like. So that's something to keep in mind. And as big of a proponent as I am of the, you know, zero RB or hero running back strategy, I did get Miles Sanders for seven bucks. I don't know exactly how I feel about Miles specifically, but there's definitely room for you if you're going to attack again, those breakout wide receivers and get your wide receiver depth and upside without devoting too much of your auction budget, you can do that and still leave, leave room for a hero RB plus like a u pretty safe, usable second running back. A lot of times in snake drafts, instead of Miles Sanders there, I'll have someone much worse, like a Naheem Hines type or something, which I think is fine. Um, but if I can get Miles Sanders for seven bucks, I'm doing it. Couple notes for NFFC specifically. There's something that gets lost in translation between their snake drafts and their auction drafts at the quarterback position where the quarterbacks just go really cheap given the scoring of six points per passing touchdown and one point per 20 yards passing. So I paid up and got Mahomes for 15. Probably could have been more patient, but like you can get Brady in the mid single digits, Dak Prescott in the mid single digits. And that's a huge advantage over the people that are spending $3 on Kirk Cousins or a few bucks on, on Tua, you know, a couple bucks on Trevor Lawrence. Uh, so I do think you really want a top 10 quarterback. I think it's worth paying up even for a Herbert Mahomes. Yeah, Allen, Allen's price is really elevated. But like Kyler Murray in particular, who's got the rushing upside, but enough passing juice to still take advantage of the scoring. Uh, I think the quarterbacks are undervalued. One thing that does not get lost in translation is the same for the auction drafts as the snake drafts. Elite tight end, for whatever reason, on NFFC seems to be an undervalued position. So if you're doing an auction, you know I highly recommend coming out of the onesie positions pretty good. You can devote you know, what I did. I spent 30 bucks to get Darren Waller and Patrick Mahomes, but I think you could even get out of there spending 25 bucks. In addition to Waller's ADP being pretty low, uh, Mark, Mark Andrews and Kelsey are kind of expensive. Kelsey's 32, which is probably, but even that's like kind of cheap. Like that's an end of round two for him in any snake draft. He's going at the one, two turn Kyle Pitts is ADP's 23 bucks. That's the end of round three. Like that's a pretty decent price tag. Um, George Kittle is 13 bucks. So he gives you a backup option to Waller 
And I just think there's such a tear break that I'd rather spend that on those guys, even though I know I can get whatever sleeper tight end I want late for like three, four bucks. I'd rather lock in the top tight end. And again, the wide receiver being too cheap in that range of the draft rounds three and a half through the through the six and a half basically is what allows you to make these luxury buys elsewhere. So uh, hopefully that helps if you do one of these NFFC auctions or if you're doing an auction in your own home league. Now, a few main event notes I wanted to go over. I think that I know that as you do these drafts, and this is something that Peter Overset and Pat Crane talked about on the episode I had them on, which is specifically geared towards the main event and how to win that. I, I suggest listening to that episode if you haven't and you're going to participate in an FFPC main event. But the dynamic that happens as we get closer to the start of the season is the best late round running back targets get pushed up. And if you you can get some of the boring you know, guys that have standalone value in rounds 11 and whatnot, but you're not getting Rashad White in round 11. You're not getting Kenneth Walker in round 11. You really have to start maybe round eight, definitely round nine. I was just in a league where we took Rashad Penny at 9.1. And by the time it came back to us at the 10, 11 turn, you know, Rashad White had gone right before us and there wasn't much there. We got Isaiah Spiller, but this was after his injury was released. So he was discounted. I'm not even sure if he was a good pick at that point. You know, Daryl Henderson, Naeem Hines, like all these other guys, they're gone. So uh, that's that's something to keep in note is that you may have to pull the running back upside trigger around earlier than you're expecting or than you're used to. And what goes hand in hand with that is I think you want to go through your head two V2s. This is something Justin Herzig is really good at when he's doing a draft is thinking through okay, if I take the running back upside here around eight, even though it's around earlier than I want to take it, you know, what's the 2v2 to like maybe my fifth wide receiver depth or fifth or sixth wide receiver depth? And with everybody pulling the running back trigger around the same time, it benefits you to be at the beginning of that run because whatever other position you were going to take for the most part, unless there's only like one guy left in the tier, there's someone coming back. You might not get your top preference, but you know you, you can get maybe Garrett Wilson as a breakout wide receiver instead of Sky Moore. Like you can make those types of sacrifices in order to get a bit more running back juice on your bench. So that's something to think through. And then the final thing, this main event that I just did with a few of my friends, Drew Dinkmeyer, Davis Maddock, Anthony Amico, and Kyle, Colin Drew. Uh, it's a fun thing to do together, the five of us. So we have an odd number of people. So we just do a vote for every pick basically after making our opinions heard. We were lucky enough to grab the 1-1, one, one, which gives you CMC. And I think that's a huge edge in terms of your tournament winning potential. The hard part with the 1-1 one, one, though in FFPC with the tight end premium scoring is you get boxed out of an elite tight end because the 2-3 turn you know, maybe you get really lucky and Pitts or Andrews last for us. Pitts went the pick before us. We were so close to getting that would have been awesome. Um, but I think it's too early at that point for Waller and Kittle and then Waller and Kittle don't come back in four or five. And then I think Dalton Schultz and TJ Hawkinson, Dallas Goddard, like that mess of guys is overvalued where they go. There's too much opportunity cost. So what we did to try to make up for that, is take multiple tight ends in that, you know, T the teens tight end range, you know, after we were pretty short up with our wide receiver depth, had some of the running back, you know, upside that we wanted as well as startable guys in that RB two spot. We hit Irv Smith. I think it was at the 11, I'm trying to, I think we, we hit Irv Smith at the 10, 11 turn. We hit Albert O there as well. And Albert O is a guy where I think the floor is pretty nil. Like he could be a rotational player, but if he is, you know, the true starting tight end and out there for a bunch of snaps, his per route run data gives him upside that other guys don't have. We were going to take Mike Jasicki as a third coming back at the 12 13 turn. Didn't happen. But at the 14 15 turn, David and Joku last, you know, just a pure bet on athletic upside. Also gives us someone that come the playoff weeks and Deshaun Watson is back, has more year or season ending upside than he does the beginning of the year. Hopefully Irvin Albert O can get us 
to that point, and then one of Albert O or Njoku hits as far as the upside goes. I think another thing we could have done, um, like Noah Fant, I think is in the mix, where if you get three of these guys, you're just taking multiple shots that one of them breaks out. You know, it's not super likely, but you got to do something to try and compete with the top elite tight end teams to close the gap a little bit. And it's just very unlikely that you're going to be 100% right on the one tight end you take if you're taking a late tight end. So I like taking multiple shots. And the multiple shots also lets you get away from maybe taking one more wide receiver because you can play with the tight end premium scoring if two of the guys breaks out or is solid, you can play in that flex spot. So uh, with only two wide receiver spots and two flex spots in the tight end premium scoring, again, you, you can replace some of the wide receiver depth by taking multiple tight ends and you're sort of devoting total spots to pass catcher rather than distinguishing it between wide receiver and tight end. But yeah, the other alternative we had was to really, after taking Irv Smith, we were pretty all on board with that. We definitely wanted one safer guy that we could start every week from the get go. We could have gone with the trio of rookie wide receivers and Isaiah likely Trey McBride and Greg Dulcich real late in the draft and maybe even drafted four tight ends um, because we would have waited. We would have had better wide receiver and running back bench lottery tickets and could have maybe chopped one of those off, add an extra tight end bet, but they're thin tight end bets. Uh, I think that makes sense though. You get some year end upside with McBride, with Dulcich, with Isaiah likely that at least gives you a chance of having a meaningful season during the playoff run. And maybe it gives you just, just enough that if CMC is truly the guy you need, well, between him and just enough at tight end, you can beat a Kyle Pitts breakout team. You can beat, you know, the Travis Kelsey, super high floor ceiling combination type of teams. Okay. Hope that helps. As I mentioned, I will be back tomorrow with Pat Crane, really excited to talk through legendary running back upside with him. As far as my stuff, you can follow it on Established to Run. Our draft kit right now is a phenomenal deal. We have rankings for so many different formats, also access to our Discord, which gives you access to season-long props. And I'm in there answering questions from time to time to help you with keeper selections or any questions you might have about your draft. So check that out over at Established to Run and also check out our YouTube channel so that you can watch episodes like this visually and it just helps us do content like this for free if you're subscribing liking to the channel thanks for tuning in everybody best of luck this season